Hello, everybody. We got a, a special show tonight, actually. Um, so Rob, Rob had a baby. Uh, what is she? Two months old now, Rob? Uh, nine weeks. Yep. Nine weeks, and he named his daughter Philomena. And mm -hmm. uh, Father Peregrine Fletcher wrote a book on Saint Philomena, and we thought it would be great, especially for Rob's daughter when she gets a little older. Because I'm gonna, to be completely honest, this is entirely selfish. <laughs> so that I have this episode to show her later on in life. Praise the Lord. That's great. So um, before we even get into the uh, into the book, though, Father, so you, you wrote a book on St. Philomena, right? Right. Right. That's okay, right. So, um, so how, long, uh, how long have you been a priest? When did you get ordained? I was ordained in that very tumultuous year of 2020. So I just celebrated my uh, third year uh, anniversary of ordination. And uh, I was ordained a deacon the year before that in 2019. And I made my uh, solemn profession of vows in the Norbertine order uh, in that same year, 2019. So I've been living and working as a, a religious and as a priest over, in total, really, uh, well, as a priest for three years. And I've been at the Abbey for a total of uh, 10 years now, since 2013. So, well, since you guys were in an abbey and pretty secluded, mm -hmm. I, I'd imagine it's not, you didn't have to deal with as much craziness as we did, right? I think that's true. And we were definitely a source of, um, I think, consolation for a lot of the faithful. Um, it was, those are tricky times to navigate uh, through for, uh, for many religious communities, but we tried to make the sacraments as available as we could. Um, yeah, those were crazy times, and uh, I'm glad we're uh, a few years out. My, my little sister leaves August 14th. She is joining the Passionist Nuns, so she did her. Um, she goes for her postulancy now, right, Rob? That's what she's going for. So she she did her. Uh, she, did, she did her aspirancy, and now she's okay. going for her postulancy. Wow. So. Congratulations! That's it's an that's an honor, and that's um. Gosh, they're a serious group of uh, uh, of religious, those passionists. So yeah. it's wonderful. Yeah, she. I mean, just a couple of stories she told. I mean, she came back. We interviewed her when she came back and stuff, and it was just like, it, like she's about ten years younger than me, and she she was always my little sister, and now she's like a spiritual mother to me. So yeah. it was just That's, such a. And she'll grow. She'll grow fast. Time in a monastery definitely it intensifies her spiritual life. And um, passionist that, that she's going to be completely enclosed. Is that right? Yes, full cloister. Yeah, yeah she'll she's going to grow by leaps and bounds. So she'll be if she was already starting out as a spiritual, uh, you know, a, a force or mother, she's going to grow all the more in these coming days. What what led you to go and look toward the Norbertines? Did you like when you yeah. were discerning your vocation? Did you check a few places out? Definitely. I actually started out as a diocesan priest when I was 19 years old. Oh, sorry, I started as a diocesan seminarian. Yeah. <laughs> and I, uh, I was, yeah, discerning my vocation. I felt a call to the priesthood. I wasn't sure exactly what to do and where to go. Um, so I thought, oh, I'll just check out the local diocesan seminary. And that was in the Archdiocese of St. Louis. Wonderful seminary. I had a wonderful experience. And I was there for six and a half years, which were really beautiful years. But I also felt like there was something missing from my vocation. And I had a sense that that was probably religious life, monastic life, um, a, a life in vows, I wasn't sure. So long story short, I ended up discerning uh, with several communities. And I discovered the Norbertines through a priest friend of mine who uh, grew up in Southern California, and I knew nothing about California, and it was so far away from Missouri, and the, it seemed like a different world and a different culture. I was hesitant to go, but I went, and I loved the monastery. And the brothers there, the fathers there, um, had a very serious religious life. They were very committed to the, the worship of God and the divine office. They gathered together seven times a day to praise God and, and worship of him. And then they were very devoted to the Blessed Sacrament. 
and uh, they had a daily holy hour. They gathered together and they prayed together. And then they were very devoted to Our Lady. And I thought all of these factors, for me, that was everything. You know, I thought, gosh, I don't know if it's uh, if it's going to work out, but I thought I need to give this a try. And that was 10 years ago now. So. Wow. <laughs> so somebody's saying that the Norbertines actually taught uh, local diocesan priests the traditional mass at the Samoran Pontificum in 07. Is that, is that true? Do you know? We have uh, several priests who are able to do that. Um, so uh, it's not a, a main ministry that we have, but we have a lot of interest in our community uh, in the old mass. Um, and we have both, we have mass in, in, in the, the Novus Ordo and then many priests at our abbey say mass in the old rite. Uh, on their own as well. So we have, we kind of have to do it all, which is another th reason that I, 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 I felt that uh, there was a sense of peace at the Abbey and Balance when I got there. So when Rob had, okay, so now when Rob had his daughter, I, I had always heard the name St. Philomena. Yeah. But when, when he told me he was naming his daughter that, and especially while his wife was in the hospital having the baby, like I started actually reading about St. Philomena. <laughs> and like, so I, I didn't, I never realized that um, we, only found her bones in like 1807, right? Right. Yeah, it was it was a long time after her martyrdom, a very long time. It's only in these recent centuries that she was uh, discovered. She's a really unusual saint um, for, for that for that reason, among others, uh, but a very powerful intercessor. Uh, but you're you're absolutely right. I was just um, so Philomena was removed. From the universal calendar so a lot of catholics that that maybe didn't grow up while she was still on the calendar might not have any idea who she is so can you give us like a, a yeah. brief summary of her story of her life absolutely so uh, you brought up a, a probably the most controversial point about saint philomena is she was caught up in the 1960s in the the kind of turmoil that the church um, had kind of entered in and there was a lot of doubt about some ancient saints uh, a lot of saints were called into question beloved saints like saint christopher saint barbara saint valentine uh, and so the the calendar the liturgical calendar was re-examined um, and some of the some of the feast days were removed and saint philomena's feast was removed but it's really important to know that her sainthood was never ever revoked and yeah. there's been some great confusion about that in the church and people think oh saint philomena's feast day is not uh, celebrated anymore liturgically uh, but it was always uh, really a local feast day the pope allowed her feast to be celebrated in certain places and certain times and that's still allowed the church still allows her, her feast to, to be taken from the common uh there in the, the commons in the missal the, the section for uh saints without a proper uh, a proper liturgical feast so you can still actually celebrate her in certain times in certain places uh so she's still a saint but her story was also um discovered after her her bones were discovered in the early 1800s uh so they, they found a skeleton uh, in the catacombs of St. Priscilla in Rome. They found a vial of her blood that was uh, buried with her. They found her name plate in terracotta tiles that was on her, uh, on her uh, tomb. And then obviously the skeleton of this 13 year old girl. And given that she was discovered with the martyrs, it was obvious uh, to the excavators and uh, to the, the, the religious leaders of the time that this is a very this is an important discovery these bones and so she was brought uh, to, to to the Vatican and she was where she was kept for several years and when her bones were eventually transferred to uh, where her current shrine is in southern Italy near Naples there were many miracles that started happening so many miracles started happening surrounding her relics wherever they went and the bishop of nola there in southern italy confirmed that these are real miracles that this is a that we don't know who this philomena is but she is clearly a powerful saint uh and so all of those uh, miracles they just kept uh, occurring and getting confirmed by uh religious authorities and eventually some years later there were several visions visionaries who had uh, pri these private revelations of the life of saint philomena and there aren't a ton of details that came through but all of the re all of the revelations matched up and they were presented to the holy office in rome who confirmed 
uh, that these uh, that there's nothing uh, in these revelations that are contrary to the faith, and we can tell the story. The story of Saint Philomena can be told in the church, and so it was told. And and many saints uh, fell in love with her. Saint John Vianney, who's uh, who is probably her biggest advocate, the Curie of ours, uh, loved her, and uh, he himself was uh, uh, was cured of uh, of an illness based on. Uh, her intercession. And also, it's really interesting to note that he saw visions of St. Philomena, that she spoke to him. And he amazingly, amazingly attributed the miracles that came to ours during his time there as the pastor. He attributed the miracles to St. Philomena's intercession, and he built a, a shrine to her, an altar. You can still go and see it today. You can still say mass in ours at her, at her altar. So it's amazing. Uh, and so it was, he had this strong devotion to her. And because she was so recent in his lifetime, he really took a, a, a liking to her and uh, became her biggest advocate of the time. So I've, I've been going to sleep listening to this uh, church history documentary. And it's really crazy because, um, so St. Philomena was during the time of Diocletian, right? right? And this is very early church history. And when you hear the stories about the saints in the early church, like the martyrs of the early church, they're some of the, they, they almost sound like fiction, but there, there were such miracles early on in the church because God wanted the faith to spread mm -hmm. that kind of, when you start to hear some of them, you're like, like when you hear uh, like, um, so I get, I get cluster headaches. So I always pray to St. Lawrence, but St. Lawrence had said, said that they, beheaded him and he walked around carrying his head and preaching still with his head in his hands. So when you hear, how, like, I, I'm going to let you tell it how she actually died, but when sure. you hear it, it almost sounds unbelievable. But I really do think God was performing phenomenal, amazing mm -hmm. miracles during this period. Right. I 100% I, I uh, agree with you. And I think, I think there are miracles that we, that are happening today too, but we don't often see them just because of the noise of our culture, because we attribute them to other, I don't know, scientific or, uh, you know, it, it certain inventions of the modern world. But I do think that you're right, that St. Philomena and those early Christian saints and those early virgin martyrs especially became in, it, super important witnesses to the power of God at work, especially because as far as a timeline goes, they were very near to the time of Christ and his, his sacred time on earth. And that means something, you know, this, this beautiful, uh, you know, infant uh, church uh, was expanding and, and, and the faith of those early Christians was so strong. And St. Philomena was one, uh, you know, in her, early, in her early years, she gave her life to Christ. And this is a commitment that she made to him. And it's something that makes her very relevant, this idea that we make a commitment and we live by that, even when the world does not agree with our commitment or give us very compelling reasons to give up on what we committed to. And St. Philomena, uh, she decided that she was going to remain a virgin and uh, be, be a bride of Christ. And even against all of the advice of people that she loved or uh, the, the, the powers the, 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 of the Roman Empire, uh, she remained she remained firm in her commitment and i think it's just such it's such the the perfect story for for our uh our you know youth and and frankly everyone today so she was right so she was thrown into the uh, she was well let's just start with she was um uh brought to rome and where the emperor uh, fell in love with her she herself was a greek uh, princess and uh, she came to rome with her father and her mother who were seeking uh, help from uh, the Emperor Diocletian in, in the protection of their small uh, Grecian state and, in, in a time of war. And he uh, fell in love with St. Philomena. And as he did with many Christians, and this often happened, uh, he simply wanted to, to take her as his own, as his bride. And she refused to do that. Uh, she was sent to prison. Uh, she was uh, tortured uh, for many days. And uh, she was thrown into... Uh, the Tiber uh, River with an anchor uh, 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 cast around her neck. She was shot at with arrows. Uh, that didn't work. None of this was actually killing her, which was a huge frustration to the powers of the time. And she just kept witnessing to the power of Christ um, and what her yes to Christ meant and what her no to them meant. Uh, it was re it's a really beautiful story. And in the end, of course, she is uh, she's killed with um, with a lance in the neck. She's beheaded. 
Um, and uh, in the end, obviously, this is her great victory, her, her martyrdom. So it, it's interesting, too, because the private revelations, which tell detail these, these, these few you know, accounts of her within her story, really confirm what happened in the ancient world. The Emperor Diocletian was, was known for having tied anchors around the necks of Christians and throwing them in the Tiber. He was known for having shot arrows. Uh, and so the fact that St. Philomena has the same story is really not unique to her. Um, so she joins the, 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 the roster of virgin martyrs really uh, for, for these really beautiful, all these beautiful reasons. So, um, so uh, Aurora Virgin is asking how we know it was her bones, and, but when they found it in St. Priscilla's tomb, there mm -hmm. were, um, there were uh, tiles, right? Right, right. There were, uh, there were three tiles that had remained through history, and the tiles were, it's pretty amazing. They said uh, the words, Pax Tecum Philomena, and that in Latin means peace to you, Philomena. And around uh, her name and on those terracotta tiles, there was uh, there were certain images, uh, uh, Christian graffiti, so to speak. There was an anchor, and there were images of arrows. Uh, there was the image of the lily, which is the image of, of holy purity. Um, so these images all kind of tell the story of Saint Philomena. They 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 were images of of how. Um, of how she died, that the ancient Christians put on her, put on her, uh, on her tombstone. There. You said that they found a vial of blood with her yes. bones. Do you know was that blood uh, dried or was it was it liquefied? Yes, uh, the blood was dried. It was. It's known to be blood be, uh, just because they, they did you know forensic testing on all of these on all of these things. So it's clear that it uh, it is blood and was uh, you know especially at. Uh, it was uh, blood. Now it's been, uh, I don't know what you would say, petrified. But there have been certain accounts uh, in church history where it has, like other, the blood of other saints has, has liquefied again. Um, but yes, as of now, it's, uh, it's, it's, um, it's just, it's uh, dried blood. Yeah, her, uh, we actually do know her story because there was a nun who actually had a, a locution where mm -hmm. Saint Philomena came to her and told her her whole story. Right, yeah. like they tried to drown her twice, I think, with the anchor around the neck, and she just refused they, to drown. Yeah, no, she did. She wouldn't. She was so strong. And yeah, the 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 nun. Uh, for those who might like like to look up uh, her and her story, her name is Sister Maria Luisa de Jesu, and she was a Dominican. Uh, tertiary uh, sister, uh, very well known and but well revered at, at the time. It was eight, it was 1833 when uh, that private revelation received its approval for uh, for dissemination when people were given the uh, freedom to to tell her story. What what drew you to this story to make you want to write about it? You know, it's a good question, and this people have been asking me. I'm so glad because it's been a beautiful reminder for my early years at the Abbey. Saint Philomena is not a Norbertine saint, so so people ask, <laughs> how did you, how did, why are you so devoted to her? And really, it's a devotion that I share with my brothers back at the Abbey when I when I became a postulant myself and entered the Abbey back in 2013. Um, there was a statue and a relic in the middle of our novitiate hallway where the novices live, and I saw uh, throughout the day that there were. Uh, various novices uh, and other seminarians stopping by the shrine there and praying to St. Philomena. They were on their knees in front of her relic. We have a relic of her bone. And uh, they would pray there. They would light candles to her. And it was, very, it was a very beautiful witness to me. I didn't know anything about her when I entered the abbey. But I decided that I maybe this is something I should also, uh, this is a saint I should um, I should also be devoted to. So it took me some time. I didn't want to just you know, uh, I wanted to kind of test Saint Philomena, and I, and uh, she proved herself to really look out for me. And she would, I know she was answering my prayers and taking care of the Abbey and and my brothers. So it was through my vocation at Saint Michael's Abbey that I discovered Saint Philomena, and uh, and why I'm s devoted to her today, as are many of my brothers uh, back at Saint Michael's. Is this a, is this a children's book, or did you really write it as an adult book? How, how did you write it? That's probably the hardest question because, yes, I think it's definitely a, a being presented as a children's book. But as my brothers 
at the Abbey uh, have told me, they said, this is a book uh, for, for kids, but it's also a, a book for adult men and whoever needs the, the strong intercession of this virgin martyr in their life. So really it's a book for anyone. The text might actually be somewhat challenging. I'd also tried to make it you know, that anyone could pick up and read it. Uh, but it's in a poem uh, form. And my hope is that when adult, an adult reads this book, they also find it's edifying and they find that they can connect to uh, as well with St. Philomena. I, I, we, talk, we talk to young men a lot and a lot of young men struggle with purity in this day and age because of the garbage that's on the internet and stuff. I, I would honestly encourage everybody to maybe pick up a devotion to St. Philomena. Yeah. Like, like that, I mean, she's a virgin martyr and I would, I would imagine, I mean, of course we all go to Our Lady and pray the rosary and stuff, but I, I, I really never heard anybody say it like this, but I really think that like the, part of the reason God grants favors to the saints is because he really wants us to know our siblings, right? Like he, right. he wants us to know our siblings in the faith and like, not just as these people who were in the past. And it's not just about the miracles. Like he really wants you to get to know, especially the, the, the early saints, like those early saints get overlooked in our day and age so much. Exactly. I mean, I was told by some publishers when I reached out to them with this book that um, the, one publisher in particular told me that they thought St. Philomena, they wondered why would she be relevant to, why would anyone want to read about her? And they, they, they said no to the book. And I was, obviously, I, it was okay with me that they rejected me, but the idea that the rejection of St. Philomena was sad because she's so relevant. All of the ancient saints, if you listen to the Roman canon, the saints the, mm -hmm. in those, those early years, they are far away from us in time, but not far away from us in grace. And uh, yeah. saints like those saints in the canon, like St. Philomena, have proven that themselves uh, to be true, to be relevant, that their stories help us. And you brought up you brought up chastity, and St. Philomena is really beloved by uh, the youth who struggle uh, to be chaste. And there's a special cord that devotees of St. Philomena can wear. It was a, a cord that was uh, given and, and approved by by uh, the popes in her time. And it's a red and white cord that you can wear around your around your waist, and it's blessed, and it's it's a symbol and a powerful sacramental uh, that that helps us uh, in our in our journey towards chastity. We get, we used to have a, a Catholic boarding school for boys at the Abbey before we moved to our new location, and we would always give those out to to the young men. And the young men in our uh, who who came to our high school love Saint Philomena, and they were so happy to wear her cord. Yeah, you know th this is a a saint who was buried, you know, out of memory for 1500 years and, and she could have remained buried, mm -hmm. but yet, uh, you know, God seems to have, uh, unburied her and brought her forth. I mean, yes. like, literally right at the beginning of, of modernity, you know, I like, I don't know how she could be more, any more relevant to us truly. Amen. I'm with you there, Rob. And I think in a way they tried to bury her again in the 1960s. <laughs> um, but she just has proven herself time after time that she she can't be uh, can't be held back, and she's going to intercede for this church. And you know, even saints saints like Padre Pio was so devoted to her, calling her the little princess of heaven. And and she, there there's just a long list of saints uh, who Saint Peter Julian Amard is another one. Gosh. Uh, St. Damien of Molokai, uh, Blessed Pauline Jericho. Uh, there's just a huge list of saints who trusted her. So I have no problem uh, trusting in St. Philomena and sharing her story. So I hope many people uh, really love her and get to know her and ask her for help. She's listening. I have a, a daughter who turned 13 on Sunday. I'm buying the book for her, but awesome. I want to make sure I let Rob get a lot of questions in because of his daughter and Rob, I'm going to let you take all the audience questions and stuff. Cause I always take over interviews on him. I feel terrible. About <laughs> Congratulations <laughs> to you, Rob on your daughter. I think that's an amazing name. That's, Thank I'm you. so happy for your daughter that she has her as a patron. That's so exciting. Yeah. We're uh, as soon as, you know, I, I grew up Catholic and, and Philomena was one of those names that you heard and there's those little um booklets that you tend to see all over mm -hmm. the all over catholic churches you know and she's one of them of course she's one but i i didn't know a ton about her and then you know i was away from the faith for about 10 years and and came back when we were um when my wife was pregnant with our firstborn and it was just it's been since then where i've really learned about her and as soon as 
my wife and I learned about her, we knew that our first daughter was going to be named Philomena. Awesome. So. Awesome. But um, so if, you know, later in life, as I'm reading this to Philomena, what what are some some themes that you kind of highlight in the book that you think would be good to really reinforce? I think that one theme that naturally surfaces from the book, I didn't even mean for it to or try to have it surface, is just a theme of um, perseverance and suffering and in darkness um, that it's, uh, it's a part of our Christian journey that will suffer, but we never ever suffer alone. And I, I hope that your daughter and I hope that whoever reads this book will see the presence of Christ, that Jesus is here present in all the episodes of her life. He was never ever absent. And there's one picture in the book that's uh, probably in my estimation, maybe the most a poignant or the most successful picture, which is Saint Philomena shrouded in darkness. It's just darkness and this and Saint Philomena, but she's holding strong and she's in pain. Um, but in the end, Christ is there and we are victorious. So I think it's that that theme of persevering with Christ and our commitment to him, even when it seems like all of our strength has been taken away. Uh, it's not. We always have our, the, the, the helpful presence and the graceful presence of our savior. You want to go through some of the questions, Rob? I mean, a couple highlighted. Yeah. Um, I, I, I mean, because I really, I'm, I'm telling you, like, we've done a couple of shows talking about the early church, and because I, I have a, uh, I have a devotion of Padre Pio. Awesome. Like, I really have been getting so much from like those early, early mm -hmm. Christians, and like it started off. We, we read. Uh, Tom Holland's book Dominion talking about the spread of Christianity but I've I'm telling you that when you really get into what some of the how even sainthood came about it was like um uh, because you hear a lot of twisted theories about it right and it, it especially from Protestants and stuff and they're like they make it like uh it, it was a way for us to worship people it's, it's like no, no no you don't realize that God granted favors to these people <laughs> specifically so that we would have a devotion to them right. and it would and you would have specific saints would actually uh like they would guard an area or a location at times and stuff and they 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 really are such a beautiful thing to to really know our history right. of our ancestry we need to get reacquainted with those saints and meet them they are all alive and well, you know, in heaven with with God, and so we have access to them there with 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 our with the Holy Trinity. So, um, yeah, but there's no reason we can't uh, get to know them. And I think that's the, the that's the call that you're answering and your interest in them. So I think it's really good. Since we only have you here for another couple of minutes, uh, we have a couple couple of questions from the audience. Sure. Um, one is, what is uh, what's like the charism of the Norbertines? Oh, that's a good question. So we were founded in a time before people were talking about charisms. We, we, we are an ancient order uh, about 900 years ago. And um, so when people ask us what our charism is, we usually tell them it's liturgy and it's the yeah. worship of God. We're canons regular. So a canon regular is... Uh, essentially charged with the duty of worshiping God in the sacred liturgy. So you can kind of think of us as priest monks, so to speak, where we uh, we gather together and we worship God. And we're also, so we live what's called the Vita Mixta. We're not uh, strictly contemplative or active. We're contemplative and active. So we get together and the, the main thing that we do is pray, but that spills over into any number of ministries, teaching, chaplains at hospitals, uh, gosh, uh, we do just about anything you can you can think of that a priest would do. We run two parishes in the diocese of, well, one in Orange and one in Los Angeles. So we kind of do it all. But the main thing that we do is worship. And the other question we have here is, uh, when did you know that, that you were called to be a priest? Uh, you know, what, what advice would you give okay. uh, to a young man maybe feeling a, a vocation? Okay. Well, firstly, I think I knew I was called to be a priest when I was, when my face was flat on the floor of our sanctuary church 
and I heard the, the words of consecration from the bishop, and I knew, okay, I'm a priest. So I knew that God is now really asking this of me. But before that moment, before my ordination, there was a lot of discernment, and I had a strong sense that I wanted to serve him. I wanted God to be, um, obviously, I wanted the God in the church. I wanted my life to be just subsumed by all things sacred and holy. Um, and it seemed to me that the best fit for me was the priesthood to, to do that. Um, this was young though, right? You were, you were, well, I mean, I was, you went to seminary in 19. I was, I was 19 and I wasn't ordained a priest till I was 33 years old. Oh, and okay. so it took me, it took me a while. Uh, and I'm a, as my mom reminds me, I'm a late bloomer. But, uh, but the thing is, I think if you're interested in becoming a priest, don't be afraid to just try, just, uh, you know, f reach out to a local vocations director or a local religious community, a monastery, and just give it a shot. That's little uh, Philomena. Is this Philomena? Oh, God bless you, Philomena. It's nice yeah. to meet you. That's little Philomena. So thank you. Father, you much, have Father. five more minutes because I I, I kind of want to sure. ask you about about your your um your upbringing because, um so I mean if you were joining seminary at nineteen did you have like a period where you were away from the faith at all like because Rob and I both were, grew up Catholic and both of us mm -hmm. kind of had a little mm -hmm. you know you get caught up in the world and you leave the faith and then you then you get it reignited later on in life mm -hmm. did you have a period or did you always really have a close relationship with Christ yeah. throughout your whole life. Uh that's a that's another real you're asking all the right questions so uh firstly before i answer that i just want to say that uh, your daughter philomena is is beautiful and what a what a blessing to your family congratulations rob thank you father um and i i'm really blessed in a way because i didn't have any long season of my life where i was away from the church i never really was away from the church um i will say that just to be fair and god knows all of the uh, details here there were moments in my life where I was very tempted and tried and doubted and wanted uh, to, to, to kind of give up on the faith. Um, but those moments were always met with, uh, eventually met with perseverance. So there was never, praise God, a time where I, I fell away, but God uses all of these stories. Sometimes a person it takes, a person's being convinced by God can take years away from the church. Sometimes it takes moments. Uh, God knows what each soul needs. So uh, for me, I would say other than, you know, many moments uh, of my life where I was tempted and tried, uh, the, uh, praise the Lord, I remained, I re at least remained in the church, even if I wasn't particularly edifying or faithful, you know. So like growing up, um, your parents, you grew up in a very Catholic atmosphere, mm -hmm. I'm imagining, right? So do you remember like that first conscious uh, I mean, a Protestant will call a born again experience. Obviously, for us, mm -hmm. it's baptism is that. But do you, do you, because mm -hmm. I, I, I think there's like a, as we get a little older in our teen years, like we, you do make a conscious, like, oh wow, this is real. <laughs> yes, I. There are a couple of moments I can point to where it was just sheer grace, where I was. I had learned all the facts, you know, of, of the faith and I understood the kind of building blocks of our church. And, but there was, I remember a couple of times in my life where I was simply struck by how God loved me. It was really the, that was the center of my, of, of even my, I would say reversion, although I was never away, I would yeah. say I had these moments of reversion that were always centered on love that I realized I am a beloved son of God. And, yeah. um, and that was, I was overwhelmed by that sense. And, and that's how he caught me. And I don't always, I wish I had that kind of fervor, that sense uh, 24 seven, but I have these moments of my life where God reminds me of that. So it, they, they weren't particularly dramatic. They were very ordinary moments where I was just kind of stopped in my tracks. And I realized God loves me and I need to do something about that. Yeah, you know, and so just the idea of becoming a priest from that or from my my early, from my late teens, uh, it always seemed to be the best way that I could respond to him. And there were lots of I was just not sure. Like I said, I really wasn't sure until my mo the moment of my ordination. And after that, now I have zero doubt of yeah. what God wants for me. You know, it re it really is amazing how God like you when you look when you look in first of all, I hate the word reversion. Like as Catholics, that we have to use reversion. Like, no, I think that all of us are called to a continuous conversion. Right, right? that's like, so true. 
Yeah. I think all of us are just always called to a continuous conversion and like a deepening of our relationship with God and, and, and a deeper appreciation for all the things. But I know like my life has been very messy at times. And at those messy times, like I really didn't see God in it. And then when you look in hindsight, you really do see God had his hand yes. in it the whole time. Yeah, it sounds, yeah, that sounds exactly right to me. I mean, I don't know if you're familiar with St. Augustine. Uh, 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 <laughs> uh, we, we, Norbertines, we follow the rule of St. Augustine that he himself wrote. And we read, oh, really? that. yes, we read from his rule every day to remind ourselves what he wrote and his life. Uh, the conf we take a course on his, uh, on his confessions. We have to be thoroughly familiar with the life of St. Augustine. And, uh, it's so important that, uh, that we have that daily conversion that, and in fact, in Norbertine, we, we, uh, we promise when we make our vows a conversion of our ways. That's a part of our formula of profession. Uh, that that's it's there. Even though we've been practicing our faith and we haven't left the church, when we make our vows, we promise to convert. You know. Uh, so I think your your the distinction there between reversion and conversion is 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 apt. Yeah, I, I feel like we're like told we have to say reversion because all these Protestant converts come in and it's like, no, 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 that's our word. That's This is our church. You guys aren't going to steal our word. <laughs> that's great. Father, that's great. I'm so grateful you came on with us, man. It's uh, First off, it's always so, um, it's so like touching for us to see priests who really do love the Lord and and, have, and are on fire for the faith still. And we will be praying for you and please pray please. for us. You've got it. I will definitely pray for you, for all your viewers and everyone out there right now. Please pray. Thank you for your prayers for me, for my community. There are uh, a hundred of us Norbertines now in our, uh, associated with our monastery. God is calling a lot. We have seven young men entering just next month. So pray for them, especially um, that they will be able to persevere and uh, overcome the many trials uh, of religious life. Uh, anyway, it's a beautiful life and the Lord wants them there and the devil does not want people to join monasteries. So we have to pray really hard for, for our religious out there. So thank you very much. Listen, I know you came on to promote the book, but we would love to just get you back on just to talk the faith sometime or something, yeah. if you're ever able to, this was such a great interview. I appreciate it so much, Rob. I'm sure Rob too, yeah. right? Oh, this was amazing. <laughs> well, so my, guys, my joy. guys, stick around. We're, Father's going to go and then Rob and I are going to hang out and we're going to talk, you know, just talk other stuff, but father, we're going to promote your book thoroughly for you we're we're so grateful you came on and i hope you i hope we i hope we don't lose touch we really yes really please, please do stay in touch and uh pray to saint philomena and she'll be watching over you thank, thank you, you so father. much father god bless you <laughs> you Take too care. that was great that was oh man i'm buying the book first off so stella turned 13 on sunday and right yeah <clears throat> and um First of all, she's got some crappy friends, like not <laughs> crappy, like bad friends, but like they, like they make plans without her and like she's home right now. And I'm like, it's summertime. And I'm like, I see she's like a little bit depressed. And I'm like, I feel terrible. And I'm like, I'm like Stella, me and you're going out tomorrow. Night. I'm taking you to the movies or something. Like I'm taking my nice. daughter to do something tomorrow. <laughs> like, yeah, like I feel so bad for her. But like, I'm going to buy this book for her and maybe just sit and read it with her. Like I, we, her and I have read a couple of books together and stuff. So this would, this would be a good one. Could get her one of the the cords too. Yeah, yeah, it's not a bad idea. Listen, I'm I'm telling you, like, <clears throat> we all need like little private devotions, especially mm -hmm. if like, I, I mean, how often do you hear from people asking like, uh, how did you conquer your addiction to whatever? You know what I mean? It's like, I really think these devotions to saints are are the thing. <clears throat> Father leaves the chat immediately. My daughter has crappy friends. <laughs> I, listen, I try to just share personal stuff with you guys, but. Um, yeah, dude, I've been watching this um, uh, church history documentary because I always have a hard time falling asleep. But this church mm -hmm. history documentary I've been watching, the guy has a very like subtle, like a not subtle, like a, a, a soothing voice. And the so music is really he subtle. sounds exactly the opposite of you. Oh, come on. We have to talk about this. <laughs> so, <laughs> we have to talk. I know what we have to talk about. <laughs> yeah. So Joe Clark messaged Rob the other day. <laughs> Joe is a, a mutual of both Anthony and I on Twitter, and he watches the show, and he uh, he has really witty, funny comments that he shares with us. And he nailed both of us pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> he gave a description of me. <laughs> oh, it's right on out. the money. <laughs> it freaked me out a bit. So he said... Well, only because you had to look up, look up the words in the I dictionary. I need a thesaurus to be this guy's friend in a dictionary. I don't even know what the heck this means. So, uh, all right. So he said, you are a garrulous autodidact. 
and that is your value proposition. <laughs> and I'm like, what? What does that mean? So Anthony's like, hey Siri, <laughs> what does garrulous mean? And Siri's like, what does gurgling mean? <laughs> garrulous means excessively talkative, especially on trivial matters. So he's got that down, right? Check mark. All right. What does didact mean? That autodidact is someone who teaches themselves everything. Which I think that's pretty fair, right? Like I, I didn't want to drop out and I didn't go to college, so so I'm an over, I'm an excessive talker on trivial matters, but I'm self-taught. So, that's a pretty yeah, fair. That's pretty thing. much right on. A pretty fair description of me, I would say. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but um, oh, yeah, you said the you said the the forbidden word though. What was that? Trivia. <laughs> I said trivial, <laughs> not trivia. It's We're different, doing- Mac. We're doing trivia next week. <clears throat> um, not no, next week. No, the 17th. not week after. Seven, yeah, the 17th. So next week, we're going to keep tonight in an hour, guys. Um, but the um, the 17th, we're doing trivia. So next week, um, on the 8th, we have uh, Charles Frowny. Or Frowny, right? Frowny, Frowny yeah. Um, I'm going to butcher that. Uh, Wednesday, Rob and I are going to be on the Return of the King podcast. Yep. Then Thursday, we have um, Keith Nestor. We're doing a lot of shows next week. And Saturday, we have Gavin Ash. Oh, boy. Yeah, Hope and Nicole are going to murder us. Mm-hmm. <laughs> They're oh. going to kill us. <laughs> Missy, you might not even know what trivia is. Missy, you're new to the channel. We do. Okay, so what we're going to do is I'm going to pick two of our paid uh, subscribers on locals are going to join us. I'm going to pick two volunteers that are that are paid subscribers. That are, you know, those who support us that want to come on. Oh, I was hoping she wasn't listening right now. Oh, my wife dead. dead. <laughs> Hope you got to bear with us. It's a rough week next week. Um, so we're gonna pick. Uh, we're gonna pick two two local supporters. We're gonna get Jason and Mark. We're gonna reach out to Angela. See if Angela wants to come on. Darren, um, we need Darren. Darren, for sure. Yeah. Uh, who else do we have to get on? Connor. Got to have Connor. Yeah. So Darren, Connor, Jason, Mark, Angela, and two local supporters. Yeah. And hopefully everybody can come. I'm sure. Uh, I know Connor is going to definitely want to come. Hopefully Darren can make it. And what we do is, Rob and I, we play Catholic trivia. And and we fight audience, over the answers. The audience plays too. So what we do is the first three in the audience that get the correct answer get a point, okay? So at the end of the episode, the top three players that got the most points, I will probably not pick the winner. I'll pick someone. (laughs) We'll get a prize. And the prize... Caitlin thinks we should have uh, Nick Cavazos. I think Nick Cavazos will still be right. That's his last day he's at Clear Creek Abbey reading the, uh, the Summa. So... He won't be able to join us for that one. Yeah, which uh, he'll be there for the next one. But we're doing it the 17th. This is confirmed. 17th, we're doing trivia. Um, I think I'm going to make the stream maybe tomorrow. And let's promote the heck out of it. Yeah, I, pro- I promoted two of them. So one one is church history and the other is saints and sinners, this history of the popes. And um, like I'm so somebody was talking about like uh when did Latin come into the church and stuff? Like I got all of that from that Saints and Sinners documentary. Like Pope Gregory the Great really unified the church with Latin. And it wasn't just Latin, like he unified the whole church with uh the calendar too. He gave us the Gregorian calendar. He wanted everybody celebrating Easter on the same date. Like he was like Gregorian chant. That's Gregorian from... chant he gave. I mean, he was one of the greatest popes we no, have ever had. No, no, the Gregorian calendar is not him. Oh, it's not? Oh, okay. No, that that's later. like Gregory the seventh or the okay, 14th okay. or something like that. But either way, he made everybody celebrate Easter on the same date. Like, he wanted unity. He mm-hmm. was like, the, the, the Latin church will be in union. So he, he's the one who pushed through Latin and everything. He's the one who got, um, uh, who, who wrote the ball game? He finalized, uh, no, that that was Jerome, but that was Jerome. Under, but I think uh, Gregory commissioned Jerome to do no, it. No, that was about a hundred or two hundred years later. It was oh, Pope okay. Damasus that commissioned. The, okay, okay, okay. Uh, trivia, um, guys. But Gregory <laughs> the Great. Trivia. That's a good question. Gregory the Great did uh, in under his reign the Roman canon was finished and remained completely unchanged until 1962. 
Um, so yeah, the his his reign. I mean, there's a reason he's called, you know, Pope Saint Gregory the Great. The Great. Yeah. That Saints and Sinners document, look, they give you the bad ones, too. I mean, you're going to go through the um, the pornocracy. You're going to go through all of that. But the, but what I took from that documentary, first of all, it's really, really strange because what, you, what you'll take from it is seeing the divine protection the church has. Like, you see some messy popes mm-hmm. in there. And it's like the church still manages to keep it together. And um, But you do see in the last episode – a clear change <laughs> when John the 23rd comes. It's like all I'm these sure. popes are talking a certain way, doing things a certain way, doing things a certain way, and then all of a sudden John the 23rd comes and let's open the windows to the world. And it's like, whoa, no, what's no going mentor. on here? It is a clear change in in something. And it's, and it's like, I don't are know you, if I'd have picked up are on Are you it saying the set is paid for that last episode? What did you say? Are you saying the set of a contest paid to have that last episode made? <laughs> no, they don't. They they in the documentary they make it like it's great and oh, I'm sure praiseworthy, right? Like they think, yeah. oh, oh, the, the church is the modern world. But you, if you're like a devout Catholic, you're watching. You go, no, no, <laughs> cancel the council, don't do it. <laughs> it's pretty great. But uh, even that dude, CNN did a documentary on the popes too. Uh, and, you and your you and your secular CNN documentaries. Well, well, the Saints document, the Pope's documentary wasn't bad until the last two episodes. Of the la- yeah, it was the last two episodes. <laughs> are horrific. Brother Michael Diamond is loving this. <laughs> the The last two episodes when they get up to Francis, you're just like, oh, yeah. please come on, stop! It's just a Francis love fest, and the whole thing is about how Francis is opening up to Islam, and the Muslims love Francis, and it's like, oh. Gosh. You know, it's I can't watch movies like with people outside uh, of like Cope anymore because it's like, you know, like the like, for instance, like Kingdom of Heaven and, you know, where they make the Templars the bad guys and everyone's cheering against it's, them. It's, and I'm like, yeah, the, the 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 um the OK, so like Vikings and uh what's yeah. the one? There's one on Netflix about like the, Vikings the last kingdom, too. the last kingdom. Right. Like I, every one of those shows, they always try to show. Um, hold on one second, uh, agrarian peasant. I'm gonna give you guys the link to the to the Pope's documentary and the other one. Um, they're both on free on YouTube. So, uh, but yeah, they they make those shows, and they're always shows that show the Vikings as the good guys, and, or like glorifying. Yeah, they're the, the, they're the uh, the open minded egalitarian. You know where women can be in charge too, sort oh, of societies, so and it's like. But it's like, okay, these these civilizations they were so great, but they all converted to Christianity. Well, it is, yeah, and it, it's preposterous. Well, it's like all the people who are into like you know so called Norse paganism again these days. It's like, you people don't understand that the, the religion you think you're celebrating, is the remnants that the Catholics allowed you to read about, like. You know, Catholic monks, the, the Vikings didn't have an alphabet. Monks yeah. took the Viking runes, turned it into an alphabet to use for their language, and then wrote down all the Viking stories That's the thing. that you, they you, thought were worthwhile. 100%. Like, even the Greek myths. Like, I, I don't think people realize that the Greek myths, we have them because it was Catholic monks that translated. So, Rob, I gave you the saints and sinners one. I'm going to give you the... Um, the other one too. Hey. How do you expect me to magically get it from my phone? Where do you want me to put it? WhatsApp. WhatsApp. Yeah. <laughs> well, you could text it to WhatsApp, can't you? <laughs> yes. Oh I come suppose. on! Can't have two of us not paying attention though, right? <laughs> We're both looking at our phones. The worst show. We are the worst. <laughs> Let me see if I can even find it. We are. We're so terrible. You guys, it, you I'm know you're, you, guys, you know you're screwed when Anthony has something he, you know, like you want to watch, and you ask him for the link because you're probably never gonna get it. <laughs> oh, I got it, I got it, I got it. Okay, wait. All right, I'm sending this one to WhatsApp. WhatsApp. <clears throat> Rob, next. Guys, it's terrible that I don't know how to share a link. <laughs> That's how bad I am. <laughs> uh, you guys right. have no idea how. <laughs> the worst. What, what what doing this show is like. <laughs> All right, Saints and Sinners. I got that one. I can send that one too. Hang on. Okay, so this one I'm putting in now is uh, um, the church history documentary. Yeah, the church history one first, and then Saints and Sinners. Yeah, guys, like these are great to go to sleep to. 
right? Like they, they are. They're good to they're because so you don't need to actually so the Saints and Sinners one, they're showing still shots. Like it's not like they have footage from the first century. So you're seeing like first off, the song, the intro song is my favorite song I've ever heard. It's a version wait a of minute, wait a minute. You mean the 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 chosen is made up? It's not real from the first century? <laughs> Are you serious? So the Saints and Sinners documentary, though, like the Kyrie that they sing in the beginning is so beautiful. I wanted to see if we could get it as like the intro for our show. It's so good. Um, well, I can, I can rip it off of there. No problem. It's going to be copywritten. Yeah. Um, But it's like, uh, yeah, so they basically just show like uh, icons and things like that. So you could even like listen to it as you go to bed. You don't even have to watch it. You know, it's like... Um, so it's it's a good one for that but uh and then the so yeah so the saints and sinners one is really good and then the the church history one i didn't know if it was going to be catholic or not but the guy like i mean it has to be like it's very catholic like it goes through all the heresies everything and like and it goes through all like the big players and the big saints that really you know pulled it all together and mm -hmm. like goes through every heresy and i mean it's it's only two hours long and you get a pretty decent snapshot of church history it's pretty cool one of my favorite classes in uh in college was uh was church history um and i, I went to the university of nebraska so it's completely secular so much of it of course was bs but i loved it because day by day you could see the devout protestants getting more and more and more confused as to why we weren't talking about their religions yeah, it was literally three quarters of the way through the class until anything that they knew was mentioned there's never been a truer statement than saint john henry newman to be to to be steeped in history is to cease being protestant like you don't understand like you really do see it it's like when you especially you start seeing like Irenaeus and Ignatius and you start seeing the way these guys spoke and and not even just that like when Irenaeus go, gets put to death like the things he says like he I want to be ground as wheat in the teeth of the lions mm -hmm. like you're like whoa we don't have anybody that talks like that anymore it's like you these guys wanted to be martyred like they were so happy they were going to be martyred, and even the uh, Saint Philomena story, Rob. Mm -hmm. Like I meant to talk to you about this when you, because I I really did watch a bunch of videos on, it, and almost all of them are children's videos, right? But I found a good one that was uh, like like really telling the adult story. Like they try to drown her with an anchor, like yep. they wrap an anchor around her neck. They drown her. She doesn't drown. They, they bring her up. They shoot her with an arrow. She doesn't die. So Diocletian throws her in a dungeon because he thinks she's going to die. And she doesn't die for days. And then he finally beheads her. But you're like, this poor girl. Like, let her die. <laughs> like, like, that poor girl. The things she... But it's like, especially early on, man. Like, when you really think about how the church spread, especially during the apostolic times, like, Paul would go put his hands on a bishop like he he would literally put his hands on a man and when paul put his hands on a man it was almost like the man received divine revelation mm -hmm. directly into his head so like you really see a a solid catholic orthodox faith immediately come about well, it's like um beckett saint thomas beckett right like before his uh consecration as bishop he was not a good guy he was not yeah. a good priest you know he was a a friend of the king and he was uh you know womanizing and he wasn't chaste and he was a drunkard and all of this and then he becomes bishop and all of a sudden he is willing to go go to his death for the faith for the faith it's crazy like uh, uh, yeah man like when you really see how that early church spread it's like it's so funny, like how Protestants would think, like, "Oh, we get the Bible and everything." Like, look at how crazy Protestantism got in a couple hundred years. Look yeah. at that in the first decades of Protestantism. Like, look at how bananas it got when everybody you, just you the had Bible Luther books. telling you know the the Protestant princes to to violently put down you know the Anabaptist and other other you know new sex like it but everybody that picked up the bible made their own religion up that's literally mm -hmm. what happened right whereas when you had paul going around laying his hands on people once these bishops like these bishops would set up they'd have it's not like they had communication like they do now it's like, like but it same, was a church a separate you know well, all, not, not, all separate 
Yeah. Well, it was one church, but like, yeah, they were separate communities that had no interaction with each other other than letters here and there, right? Mm -hmm. So it was like to 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 realize that these men, wherever an apostle set up a church where a patriarchate would get set up, like, so you really got to realize Peter went to three different places. He went to Antioch. He went to well, Constantinople or. Uh Antioch, Antioch, Alexandria, Alexandria and, and Rome, Rome, right? So you had the Bishop of Rome was the Pope, but you had the patriarchs of those other two. Like th those three always had pride of place because of Peter. Like because Peter went to those, like even those, even though he dies like, in Rome. Like we celebrate the, um, I don't know about the Novus Ordo, but we used to liturgically celebrate the chair of St. Peter at, at Antioch and the chair of St. Peter at Rome as separate feasts. Yeah. Yeah, because those seats were so important. And that that church history documentary really goes into like all these little things. And Anthony says like so much. I'm not sure if he's trying to get us to hit the like button every second. If he's... Remember that oh, woman? Said that, that's like that's what that woman. Yeah, you say like <laughs> a lot. Listen, guys, I'm tr all right. I'll try not to say like. I'll do my best. It's not going to work. No, it's not. I'm terrible. Um, Especially, it's like it's it's like it's one of those words that you use to stall for a second as you're trying yeah, to collect I your mean, thoughts. Yeah, it's just part of that hoopla. <laughs> <laughs> that, I'm still embarrassed about that. But oh. no, we all say. Uh, I have a friend at work that says the f word when he's doing that. Like he's like effing, instead of saying like effing. instead he says instead of saying like he'll go ethin 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 like when he's trying to think it's like you need a second to think so you say a word be you bro I'm just mad thank you I you guys can always rank on me I don't care <laughs> <laughs> yeah I'll switch to uh instead of like <laughs> um yeah these uh I I think these documentaries are good to watch just they give you little bits and tidbits of the faith that you may not have picked up and how you know it's hard to read a lot of times if you're driving in your car they're good to listen to these are yeah. these are not visual things you know they, they're basically podcasts so you can check out a i'm gonna now when i re-listen to this and i hear myself say like it's gonna drive me crazy you know and what, like oh i just did it too <laughs> <laughs> thanks guys <laughs> but um you know i used to read a lot more before kids and of course yeah. now not only is there less time but kids love to grab whatever is in your hands yes they do it, you know so whether it's an ipad i'm reading on a kindle on and they want to throw it to the ground and break it or if it's a book they want to grab it and rip it so i don't get to read a lot anymore and like i've noticed that audiobooks number one i'm a much more visual learning uh learner so listening i don't retain as much but audiobooks don't work very well just in general i feel because it, that was written to be read yeah. whereas a podcast which is words being spoken just like but it's meant to be listened to it's a conversation it's meant to be listened to yeah um uh so father was uh we have coming on august uh september 9th yep i'm excited september for that saturday september 9th we have father monsley coming back on. are we going to try to do that one on youtube i don't know his, i think his latest just... his latest book is about um all of his books are about type, typology. It's but this the, one's old, about the, the old and new series. But this one is about typology related to the conversion of the Amish yeah. at the end of time. <laughs> so that might be interesting. The people of the old covenant. Oh, man. I had a fight with my wife before I came on today. Is this one of those videos we're going to hope she doesn't watch? I don't care if she watches. I'm so mad at her right now. I have no idea. She disassembled my whole studio before I came on. Like I, I'm... well, you don't you don't think she's gonna read Augustine's uh, Confessions, bro? No, that's the point, right? So she takes my books. She takes, she takes the brother's caravans. Like she's not reading Dostoevsky. She couldn't even read. She You're couldn't... not reading Dostoevsky either. I stop your nonsense. I read the brother's caravans <laughs> stop off. Nonsense. Stop your nonsense. I haven't read the idiot yet. I think it's a biography. What about crime about and punishment? Me. <laughs> Crime and Punishment, I haven't read either. But uh, The Brothers Crime Caramel's off my Man, that sounds like me just doing this podcast. <laughs> Crime and Punishment. <laughs> Crime and Punishment is what I put you through, and The Idiot is a biography <laughs> about me. Um, <laughs> so she comes down, and she takes Augustine City of God. She takes The Brothers Caramel's off. She took 
uh, the little flower of St. Francis of Assisi. The little flowers of I'm like, you're not reading these. Why are you taking? She wanted them for decorations upstairs. I'm like, but I need <laughs> them for decorations down here. I broadcast what goes on my shelf. Nobody's coming in the house. <laughs> Killer woman. <laughs> He's nuts. Oh man! All right, we're gonna keep this one at an hour tonight, kids. <laughs> yeah, we've been off the rails for half an hour. <laughs> Rob, I sent Rob a bunch of stories tonight. I'm like, I just thought sending him stories. Well, why don't we chill out with any of the controversy? We're having, we're having a priest on tonight. Why don't we chill? Because you know we don't want his face in a video. Yeah. Where Anthony says something crazy. Where, where we're talking about Vigano's latest letter or something. Right. Like, you just don't. That's you sent me that and I'm like, uh, maybe we don't do this with Father Peregrine. Yeah, no, and that, that was actually very, very um sound reasoning. Like I'm glad you did. Um Oh man, I'm tired. Sorry guys. Uh yeah, I had I mean, is there anything we could talk about that I sent you? Um, has anything happened in the last few days? Well the Oh, we should. Everything we said about. Should uh, we do the Matt Gasper's tweet? Yeah, what was that one? Let me look that one. Bring that Matt Gasper's tweet up. (laughs) World Youth Day. Oh, yeah. I was just going to say everything we said about World Youth Day has been proven to have been right on the money. 100%. Uh, It turns out the consecration of host in the ikea bowls might not have even been valid at all so wait so what was the deal with that would you think those were consecrated at a mass before that though no so i haven't seen any official story all i saw was a tweet by one priest not a rad trad priest not even a traditional priest as far as i know just a conservative novus ordo priest who said that he had heard that they had all the uh eucharistic ministers standing around the whole area with the unconsecrated host in the ikea saboriums so they weren't on the saran wrap so they weren't on the altar they weren't even uncovered to because the the part of the the form is the priest is like the breath of the priest like actually as he says the words of consecration touching the the sacred species um so And I don't know if this is true, but like I said, it sounded like they had already been handed out and were all over during the consecration and probably were not consecrated at all. So I thought they were consecrated at a previous mass and that that's, I mean, I don't know. Which that's that's legit because, you know, I mean, a lot of times the the priest will pull the ciborium out of the tabernacle with yeah. hosts from At a the previous priest. mass, they were consecrated. Right. So if if that's the case, that that would be, I mean, they were validly consecrated then at least. But of course, it's still pretty significant Eucharistic the, abuse. What happened after the whole idea of con celebration is weird to me. Yeah, like that whole idea of like seven or eight bishops up at the altar together and they're all holding their hands up. Like that's a weird thing to me. Well, it doesn't exist in the Roman Rite prior to 1970. You know, it's, and I, I don't know if it exists in the Eastern churches, um, but it, it's not. It's not a Latin practice, not a it's, Roman practice. It's just weird to me. It's like because I mean, are they all acting as Christ at this? Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's the sacrifice. Yeah, of, the of one, the, altar. the one priest is standing in persona Christi. It's a, it's yeah. a weird thing, man. Like, I don't, I just don't, I don't know. Man. I don't know. The more, the more you attend the traditional liturgy, the more you dislike the Novus Ordo. <laughs> well, like, as, as Father Maudsley says, the more you realize how disoriented, um, you know, the, the, the modern right is. It's just weird. Like, all of it's weird. I don't know. It's, it's just, it's all weird stuff. I don't know. Yeah. I, wanna... I, I was going to say here, I, I, as far I, as I heard that the Eastern as far as I know, okay, have something called it, but the theology behind it and the practice of it is once again far different. Just just like how um, in the few Eastern churches that do have communion in the hand, it's not the current Roman practice, right? Yeah. It's completely different. Completely different. And it's like even if like I mean the way like the way they'll say the communion in the hand thing they'll be like this is actually a practice from the early church it's antiquarianism right so they 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 take this quote from Saint Jerome 
where St. Jerome is talking about a very specific situation where he's saying, take your hands and make them like an altar and you bow before the altar. And he, yeah, you, you, you don't it. pick it up and put it in your mouth. You go like you this. You go like this. And, and like, then you venerate your eyes with your hands. You venerate your ears. You Because your hands touch the consecrated host, yeah, right? So it's right. like, so they, so they describe this antiquarian practice that, that it's like if that was how people were receiving, maybe, but right. that's not what's going on. Like if you watch World Youth Day and you watch how the people were receiving there, it's atrocious. Like it's just it's just so offensive. And if you're not offended by it, it's like I don't know if you really know what you're looking at, right? Like, uh, right. I mean, not to not to judge anyone, but I I just like it's something like this. Like the reaction within me is like yeah, visceral. You know, it, it like it. Is so against like my my well you know your, your census, Catholic sensibility census for day you know? yeah it yeah just... dude at, at my son's confirmation it was at a Novus Ordo mass mm-hmm. and it was uh, I went up to the pre it was during COVID right so it's 2020 during COVID and everybody's got masks on and I go up to the to the priest uh, before the confirmation I'm like Father. Is there any way I can receive on the tongue if I wait till the end? If I'm the last one to go, I'm like, I would really like my son and I to both receive on the tongue. He goes, I, I just can't do it. The, the head pastor won't allow it. You know, like he wanted to. But the the head pastor wouldn't allow it. So I didn't receive it, my son's confirmation. But I'm sitting there and I'm watching everybody with their masks on. They're going up with their masks on, holding mm-hmm. one hand out, pulling their mask off, and then receiving it. And three hosts hit yeah. the ground at one mass and i gasped like i was like <gasps> and no one and, else even and nobody else even thought anything of it no. the guy just picked it up off the ground put it in his mouth he broke it in half on the floor it's like what is going on here like after, especially after like for going for months at the traditional mass and then seeing something like that it was like i was irked like so mm. upset that nobody can and i'm like how do you, how do you as a priest how do you as a priest continue that practice? I don't know. Like, honestly, as a priest, you see this happen during COVID, especially you're seeing everybody with the mask and it's dropping and it's falling on the ground. How do you honestly continue that practice when you see that happen so often? Like, I, I really, I don't know, man. Like, you wonder if these men, I don't know. I, I don't Mary, judge Mary here says that World Youth Day 2023 has the lowest attendance. Oh, it's under a half ever. a million. It's under a half a million. That's and, like and the like, first time. It's not even close. You know, besides all the, uh, of course, abuse and just kind of irreverence that happens at these things, you know, you hear the argument said by those that support it, like, oh, but look at all the good it does. It's like, it's not. It's failed. I mean, it, it, every one of these has failed, right? You, My, Mike if this Lewis, is the lowest attendance ever. Mike Lewis tweets out a Where Peter Is article bragging about the amount of catechesis going on. There's these catechesis sessions going on. There's hundreds of them. And I read the article. It's like, yeah, this fish. this looks like catechesis right here, folks. <laughs> this is the tweet. Are you joking me? <laughs> Interpretive dance with lettering. Look, I'm going to be honest. You, we, oh. we, you guys are just old now. Like, this is what the young kids are into. This is oh hip. yeah, yeah. This, this is, is hip. hip. Uh-huh. This is hip. I'm telling you. We yeah, because how many of those half million kids can even read the English that they spell right? this in? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> it's in Lisbon, and they put words in English. Um, so he puts out the article saying how much cat. This catechetical sessions going on. Hundreds of them. It's Bishop McElroy giving one. It's all these horrible men giving these catechetical sessions, not on the Catholic faith on the synodal church on synodality that's not that's not catechesis i'm sorry that's like the opposite of catechesis that's like teaching people away from the faith even the things francis was saying today yeah i know that this parish is actually i think where my cousin got married i don't know if you if you remember during covid that there was a parish handing out in ziplocs that was the parish my cousin got married at so Francis today says um, uh, everyone is welcome in the church. Everyone, no exceptions. Everyone, sinners. Everyone, all sinners. It's like, um, well, obviously. Well, duh. Come on. It's been the practice of the church forever. Like, why are you making a big deal of it? What you're not saying is that everyone is welcome with requirements. 
Like there are requirements. Like you can't just say everyone's welcome and doesn't matter. No, there's like there's there's requirements to being Catholic. There just is. Otherwise, what did the martyrs die for? Yeah. And it's like it's like the, the, he'll always say something true, but a half truth and leave out the important part. Right. Mm -hmm. Like it's just it's just or or in those times where he actually does say something fully and they only report on half of it, which. Yeah, that's true. But you never hear a clarification never, from the Vatican anymore. saying this is what was really said. Yeah, they've just totally abandoned that practice because he likes he likes the messiness. He likes, likes that ambiguity. Confusion. He likes the ambiguity. Yep. He likes it all. Because he'll say something true but ambiguous so that people can then say, see, the church is a church for sinners. And yeah, like that's mm. literally what it is. is what, I mean, we're all sinners. No, Nobody in the history of the church came in saying I'm perfect. Mary. What did Mary say? Oh, obviously. But she never Mary, came to say Mary it. was perfect. <laughs> Thinking about Mary in our comments. I'm like, Mary says she's perfect? Really? <laughs> 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 Poor Mary. Oh, uh, oh Paul. The good ouch. news is that the kids, that all the kids are so drunk that no one paid attention to Father Mark. <laughs> yeah, dude, I think like... It, if you're going to one of those things, it's like you're looking for a bar. It's like, ah, let's just all go hang out and meet up. It's like, are you really going to go see a Bishop McElroy catechetical session? Come on. What is the point of, of any of this stuff? <laughs> Maybe this is just my anti, my, my anti-socialness coming up. But why would you go to any of this stuff with half a million people? Like, yeah, how is that gonna, like going to How can you feel like an intimate connection with God with half a million people around you? Imagine if Father James Martin converted. That would be unreal. He just becomes base and starts saying the seal of region orthodoxy. We need to, that's, listen, man. Uh, I, I'm so, uh, somebody who's been a, 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 a frequent guest on this show. Not frequent, but been on more than once. Uh, has a sister who was living the rainbow lifestyle. Very disordered. Almost went trans. And is coming into the church. And this is a pretty big, pretty big person who's been on our show. And the like the miracle that this person went from that to not just Catholic, but like traditional Catholic, like going, getting received into the church and a traditional mass, like all of it. It's like, don't think anything is beyond God. If if Augustine could become St. Augustine, I wouldn't put, you know, we can't put it past God that Slim Jim Martin might become based yeah. <laughs> but i'm not gonna bet money on it yeah i'm not mostly, gonna bet money on it <laughs> because i need to put it into the show and plus we need free will we all have we all have free will to reject god's grace so but you never know how it's gonna go but all right let's wrap this Re up because rebuilding the bridge <laughs> <laughs> that's actually great <laughs> oh um, man that would be so awesome uh, all right, so well, let's promote Father's book again, though, before we go. So yeah, so I'll hold on. Let me throw it in the chat. I'm I, I'm going to throw it in the description. Uh, probably half an hour or so after we get done here. Uh, I want to order that book. Actually, I'm going to order it right now. It. Uh, I don't think Where you can. I, order I think it. it from? I think it releases on the eighth. Okay, so it's pre-order or it's pre-ordered now, and it's right now only available at Tan. Okay, good. So m most of the the interviews we do on books, guys, are from Tan. We have a, a rep over there that helps us schedule interviews. So we'll have Dr. K on hopefully sometime soon to talk about a couple of his books, too. Oh, also, jo uh, Joshua Charles' book from Sophia is dropping. Um, that, I think that's pre-order now. It's pre-order it now. So In October, I think. Yeah, so Joshua Charles' book is coming out uh I want to make sure we promote that. We'll get him back on to talk about that. Maybe we'll get his co-author on with him. Uh, ba, 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 ba. Let's see. So Mary says, she says it's, it's sold out, but I'm on their website right now, and it's his pre-order now. Which book is that? Uh, my my name is Philomena. Oh, okay, okay. Well, I don't know yeah. if she's talking about the same book. It's not released yet, so... Um, yeah, so Joshua Charles's book is called Persecuted from Within, How the Saints Endured Crises in the Church. 
Uh, he co-authored that with uh, uh, Alec Torres. So we'll get maybe we'll get both of them on to talk about that book. What does pre-order even mean? To the well, the, you, the phrasing is weird, right? Because you're ordering. Yeah, you're you ordering, ordering it but, before it's actually going to be sent out to you. So you get your order in, and then the, you you might actually get it a day or two before it goes officially on sale. Right. They they're just saying they they're going to get it from the actual printer at a certain date, and they think they can have it ready to ship on the release date. Sometimes it gets, yeah. The reason you know, they do pre-order is because they want to get an idea of how many they should print. Yeah. So, but yeah. All right. I'll reach out to Josh. Let's go, Rob. Let's wrap this okay. up. Sounds good. Adios, everybody. United the Clans. Enoch. Let's go. Yo, yo. Uh. Take me back to my reversion.